Namaskaram, Michael. Namaskaram. We are currently having the fourth meeting in the series um, about the talks of the book Uladu Napru, Ramana Maharshi's 40 Verses on What Is. And the, the topic of today is, let me read it, since ego is an erroneous awareness of ourself, it can be eradicated only by correct awareness of ourself, which means awareness of ourselves as we actually are. Um, because some people ask it, this is, as I said, the fourth um, uh video in a series of eight videos and if they want to they can look back in the videos yeah. looking for part one two and three um but before we get uh, get diving deep into that i want to make some announcements that might be interesting for the viewers first of all you already told that in uh, one of the previous videos you have there's a new domain name for your website it's currently called freeramanateachings.org um, and you also made a new homepage, which might be quite interesting for people to read. Another announcement I want to make is you also updated uh, the introduction to the book, uh, this book. You've written an introduction for that, and you currently uh, let me know that you uh, improved the introduction a little bit with adding some verses. So people who might be interested can go to your website to read that. Um, another announcement I would like to make is, and let me get the page in front of me so that I say it correctly. You have written an article on your uh, blog site, which is called Pure Intransitive Awareness Alone is Real Consciousness and What Actually Exists. And that article is a part of a landscape of consciousness toward a taxonomy of explanations and implications by Robert Lawrence Kuhn. He's also known from PBS, Closer to the Truth. And I'm not sure if that's exactly the same article, Michael, or that you, uh, well, or that well, you what, add some things. Well, what happened, he, he had, um, he wanted to say something about Bhagavan's teachings, but he, I think he doesn't know very much. So he had written something based on some of my writings, but it wasn't really so germane to the, to a topic. So I then uh, wrote a, a brief um, overview of Bhagavan's teachings about consciousness and sent it to him. He yeah. quoted from that in his landscape uh, article. So I, what I have put on my website is, is what I had sent him from which he took extracts to include in that landscape article. Yeah. And the, the whole article is available for everyone, the complete article. But yeah, on your website is also the part that you, that's part of that book. Yeah, with yeah. Some more additions to it. Yeah, perfect. So anyone who's interested could read that. And then a final announcement I would like to make is, as I already announced in the in the book, Ramana Maharshi's 41st, mm. as the next book I wanted to do is about Nanyar, Who Am I, based on your writings and talks. And I'm happy to announce that I'm currently in the final phase with the final verses being proofread by volunteer volunteers. And um, the the introduction of the book is is a, is the introduction that's on your website. And you were you said you were willing to see if that could also be updated. And if necessary, then there can be an updated version in the book. So well, as soon that is ready, yeah. we are ready to publish. So that would be anywhere in the next few weeks, I guess. So these are the announcements for now. So unless you still have to say something, we can dive no, into the no, subject no. of today. Oh, ju just one clarification. You referred to um, to me posting on my website uh, the introduction I had written for your book. I did, it's not on my way. It's on the blog, but it, I posted that. Oh, I'm sorry. That. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a website and there is a blog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you for clarifying that, yeah. Michael. So the topic of today, um, let me repeat it again. Since ego is an erroneous awareness of ourself, it can be eradicated only by correct awareness of ourself, which means awareness of ourself as we actually are. So uh, Bhagavan talks a lot about this, uh, this ego. Um, could you explain what, Mike, of, of what Bhagavan means by saying that ego is an erroneous awareness of herself? Yes. That is, Bhagavan often used to say, ego is the thought, I am this body. Um, uh, what he meant by that, by saying it's the thought, I am this body, it's the false awareness, I am this body. 
And further clarification, false, the false awareness I am this body means that which is aware of itself as I am this body. So the nature of, of ourself as ego is to be always aware of ourself as I am this body. Um, Bhagavan has, um, I mean, Bhagavan often clarified this, but one one verse in which um, we can find uh, a clarification of this is um, verse 20, 24 of Uludunapadu. What Bhagavan says is, um, in the first sentence, he says, Jada Udal Nan Enadu. That means the insentient body does not say I. Insentient is a translation of the word Jada, which means it's insentient in the sense that it is not aware. The body is devoid of awareness. When Bhagavan talks about the body in context such as this, he's not just referring to the physical body. In an earlier verse, in verse 5 of Uludunapadu, he begins by saying, Udul Panchakosa Uru, the body is a form of five sheaths. Um, <coughs> uh, Adanal, uh, Udul Ennum Solil, Aindum Adongom. Uh, therefore, um, uh, all five are included in the um, in the term body. So what, what he means here is, but what, what he meant by the five sheaths is the, the physical form of the body is what is called the Anamaya Kosha, the, the sheath composed of food. In other words, the physical body. The, um, uh, the life that animates the body is called Pranamaya Kosha. Uh, prana means life, or it, it often is translated as breath, but uh, because breath is one of the one of the most obvious manifestations of the life. But what prana me means essentially is the life. So all the physiological functions in the body are the manifestation of the life that is in the body. So the the, the pranamaya kosha is the sheath composed of life. Um, then uh, there's the Manomaya Kosha, the chief composed of mind. Um, mind in this context means the grosser functions of the mind. That is perception, memory, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and so on. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are called the uh, Manomaya Kosha. Um, uh, then the subtler of the Manamaya Kosha is the Vijnana Maya Kosha. That is the sheaf composed of intellect, the understanding, reasoning, um, judging, uh, uh, discern, uh, di distinguishing. This is the function, the, the functions of the intellect. This is the, called the Vijnana Maya Kosha. And subtlest of all is the what is called the Ananda Maya Kosha or is also called the karana sarira, the causal body. Ananda maya kosha means the sheath composed of happiness. That is uh, uh, what is otherwise called the chittam. The chittam means the will. It, is, it consists of, um, in its most basic form, it consists of vasanas. Vasanas means inclinations. The inclination, these in, the vasanas are what give rise to likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, hopes, fears, and so on. So the, all these likes, dislikes, desires, and so on, these are the grosser manifestation of the, um, of the will. In seed form, they are what are called vasanas, which means inclinations. Um, so um, these five that is the, the physical form of the body, the life that animates it, and the mind, intellect, and will that function within it. These are called the uh, five sheaths. So Bhagavan says the body is a form composed of five sheaths. Why does he say that? Because we never experience a body, uh, we never experience a dead body as ourself. Whatever body we experience as ourself, it's always a living body. So it's endowed with life. 
we also never experience a sleeping body as our, ourself. It's always a body that seems to be awake. Even when we're dreaming, the body that we have in a dream seems to be a waking body. That is, in dream, it, we, it, we, we recognize a dream to be a dream when we leave that dream. But while we're actually experiencing the dream, it seems to us to be the waking state. We may think sometimes, oh, this can't be really happening, this must be a dream, but it still it seems to us to be the waking state. Um, if, we're, if we're in danger, if we're um, on the edge of a precipice or something about to fall, we feel, we feel fear because we, we, if the, whole, if the dream seems real so long as we're experiencing it. So um, <clears throat> the... Um, since we never experience a sleeping body as ourself, the body we experience as ourself is always living and it always seems to be waking. Because it's living, it's uh, the, the life is fun is animating the body. Because it's um because it's awake awake, the the mind, intellect, and will are functioning within the body. So when we experience the body as ourself, we are experiencing all these five sheaths as they're called. Sheath means in the sense of a covering. Um, the, the word kosher means a, a sheath or a covering. Um, so these five coverings are we experience as ourself. So coming back to verse 24, he says, Jada udal nane nadu, but uh, insentient or non-aware body does not say I. So body here doesn't mean just the physical body, it means all these five sheaths. And when he says it doesn't say I, this is a metaphorical way of saying the body is not aware of itself as, as I. What, why is the body not aware of itself as I? Because it's jada, it's not aware, it's insentient, it, it means it's devoid of awareness. So since it's devoid of awareness, the body is not aware of itself as I. So that's the first sentence. In the second sentence, he says, Satchit Udiyadu. That means Satchit does not rise. Satchit means being awareness. Um, it's a compound word. Uh, it doesn't mean, it's not referring to two things. It's, uh, it's, it's two ways of describing the same thing because um, uh, our very being is awareness. Awareness is our being. They, they, they are not two separate things. Um, it's, it, that, that, that is, being means what actually exists. And uh, awareness here means pure awareness. So what actually exists is pure awareness. So it is referred to as such it. That is, that, that's referring to what we actually are. And he says such it does not rise. Does not rise means it doesn't change its state. It doesn't go from being one thing to another thing. It doesn't rise into existence. It doesn't, um, it doesn't undergo any form of change. It just is as it always is. Uh, and then in the third sentence, he says, Udalalava nan endru ondru udikum ideo. Ideo means in between. In the context, that implies in between the body and such it. Um, but again, this is this is expressing it metaphorically because the body obviously cannot exist apart from such it because such it is existence itself, being itself. Um, so without such it, there would be no body. But um, when we rise as ego, we experience uh, our. Um, the, the, we 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 can distinguish the body from satchit. That is the the body is the form, satchit is the substance. So just like we can distinguish gold from gold ornaments, we can distinguish satchit from the body. The body is a mere form, the substance, the reality is satchit. So, but speaking metaphorically, he says in between. That means in between the body and, and such it. This, had, this has um, two implications when he says in between. Um, <clears throat> the first implication is the only connection that um, 
but the body has this such it, is through this intermediary. This intermediary is ego. So in that sense, ego, that, that, to understand why that is so, <clears throat> the body and all phenomena have absolutely no existence of their own. They all seem to exist only in the view of ourself as ego. That is only when we rise as ego, but we become aware of body and world and all other things. So all these, all phenomena uh, borrow their semi existence from the semi existence of ourself as ego, because they seem to exist only in the view of ourself as ego. So, um, uh, and ego is connected with Satchit because ego, as Bhagavan explains in this verse, ego is a is a conflation of Satchit, which is pure being awareness, with the form of a body. So um, the, the connection between all these phenomena and Satchit is ego. Ego is the subject. All phenomena are objects. Objects seem to exist only in the view of the subject. The subject is not satchit, because satchit always just is as it is. It doesn't rise to know anything other than itself. So what rises to know other things is ego. So it, it, uh, that's one sense in which this, uh, that is one um, uh, implication we can, uh, or inference we can draw from this word ideo. Another implication is, if you read a story in the newspaper, in a newspaper or online or somewhere, and you're not sure whether the story is true or false, you're, you're, you doubt the veracity of the story, you may ask a, a friend, is this, uh, is this story uh, true or false? Your friend may say, it is neither true nor false, it's somewhere in between. What that implies is, it is neither entirely true nor entirely false. It's got some elements of truth in it. It's also got some elements of fiction in it. So we cannot say it's entirely true. We cannot say it's entirely false. It's somewhere in between the two. Uh, likewise, ego. It's neither entirely real nor entirely unreal. It's got an element of reality, namely Satchit, and it's got an element of unreality, namely the the, the body, but it, it takes itself to be. So this word ideal here is a very significant word. So what he says in this sentence is, in between one thing, Andrew, Nan, I, that is one thing I, I, I here is standing in opposition to Andrew. Um, so one thing I, uh, Udikum, rises, uh, Udalalava as the extent of a body. <clears throat> um, since this thing called uh, this one thing I, since it rises, it is not Satchit. But since it's limited to the extent of a body, so, so since it rises, it's um, it's um, it's not Satchit. But though it is limited to the extent of a body, it is. I, I, I denotes awareness. That is, it, uh, I is the natural name of what is aware. That is, whatever is aware of, is aware of itself as I. It's, this isn't about, this, we're not talking here about the word I, but about what the word I refers to. The word I always, in whatever language it may be, so whether in Tamil it's Nan, in Sanskrit it's Aham, in English it's uh, I, in French it's Je, and, um, so, so in different languages it has um, uh, different words, but what these all these words refer to, they're referring to that which is aware of itself. So I is the natural name of awareness, the name by which awareness knows itself. So anything that is I is aware, that, that I implies awareness. Of course, we can, we can program computers or robots to say I, but they are not actually aware of themselves as I. In natural language, I is a word 
but is used by what is aware to refer to itself. So since it is since it's a, uh, aware of itself as I, it's not the body, because the body is is non-aware and therefore not aware of itself as I. So it is neither the body nor is it Satchit. It's not Satchit because it rises, it's not the body because it's aware of itself as I. But it is it is uh it is limited to the extent of a body. When he says Udalalava as the extent of a body, that means it is it is limited to the extent of a body. That is, when we when we rise as ego, we're aware of ourselves as I am this body. So whatever is inside this body is a part of me. Whatever is outside this body is something other than me. The shirt I'm wearing, this isn't me. This is something other than me. But what's inside the shirt, the skin and the flesh and the bones, that's all me. That That is our experience when we rise as ego. So as ego, we are limited to the extent of the body. So um, we are limited both in time and in uh, space. That is, uh, uh, we, we are confined within the spatial dimensions of the body. We're also confined within the temporal dimensions of the body. The body was born at one time, it's going to die at another time. So, so long as we experience ourselves as I am this body, we seem to be uh, limited in time. We were born so many years previously, and some years or months or days or minutes or seconds ahead, ahead sometime we don't know when, we're going to die. So uh, we, we are limited in time and space. Not only are we limited in time and space, in, in Vedanta philosophy, they, uh, Advaita philosophy, they talk about being limited in time, limited in space, and limited uh, uh, as vastu. That is, I am this thing, not that thing. So each thing is, we, 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 when we limit ourselves as this body, we seem to be distinct from all other things. So in all these ways, we are limiting ourselves when we rise as ego. So the implication here is that ego is not the body, nor is it Satchit, but it is that which is aware of itself as I am this body. Since it's aware of itself as I am, it has an element of Satchit in it. Since it's aware of itself as I am this body, it has a limit a element of body in it. So it is it's neither that's why I said ideal implies it's neither entirely true nor entirely false, neither entirely real nor entirely unreal. The body and all phenomena are entirely unreal. Ego is un, ego as ego is unreal because it identifies itself with these things. But there is an element of reality. That is, that element of reality is the fundamental awareness I am. So this is what why Bhagavan said, ego is the false awareness, I am this body. In other words, it's that I which is aware of itself as I am this body. The I am portion of ego is such it. The body portion is... Uh, uh, is what is unreal and what is uh, insentient. In so in, he goes on to say in the next sentence, idu chit jada granti. Chit jada granti means, um, chit means uh, awareness, here referring to satchit, the real awareness, the being awareness, the pure awareness I am. Uh, jada here refers to body, which is insentient, and granti means a not. So when when the awareness is seemingly entangled with the body, that entanglement is what is called chitjadagranti. So so long as we are identified as I am this body, this is this functions like a knot. It is something that we need to unravel. We need to distinguish ourselves as the pure awareness chit from this body which is jada um, but so long as we rise as ego we we have conflated these two we so uh, now it seems to us that i am this body that is we 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 are fully identified with this body 
um, uh, we may understand, of course, if we study all this philosophy and everything, we may understand this body is not what we actually are, but that doesn't solve our problems because we who understand this conceptually are but I that is aware of itself as I am this body. And so this 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 knot is such a tightly entangled knot. Since it's a knot, it's a bondage. So the next word he says is bandham, bondage. That is, this is all one sentence. He, that is, the, the sentence is, idu chichara granti. This is the, the uh, awareness, non-awareness not. Uh, in other words, the false awareness I am this body. It is bandham, bondage. Um, because we are bound to the, to the limitations of this body. And even if this body dies, because the nature of ego is to is to constantly the ego cannot rise without a, a limiting itself to the extent of a body. When one body dies, it projects another body. Um, as happens for in in, in uh, sleep. In sleep, this this body is supposedly. Uh, lying asleep on a bed, or so we suppose, or in the waking state. But in dream, we experience ourselves as a body that is running around, doing, engaging in all sorts of activities and everything. So um, the, the ego has this ability to project and identify itself as a body, as it does in dream. And according to Bhagavan, this waking state is just another dream. So it uh, it is bondage. It is jivan. Jivan means the soul, um, the individual, uh, the separate. Uh, yes, the separate individual. Uh, it is nupame. Nupame means subtle body. Um, but an important thing to clarify here: the word subtle body is used in two senses in Advaita philosophy, and, but often people fail to distinguish these. Sometimes three of the five sheaves, that is the pranamaya kosha, manamaya kosha, and the jnanamaya kosha, these are sometimes referred to as the subtle body. That is, these five sheaves are, are divided up into three bodies. The physical body, the Anamaya Kosha is called the Stula Sarira, the gross body. The, the Pranamaya Kosha, Manamaya Kosha, and Vijnanamaya Kosha are collectively referred to as the Sukshma Sarira, the subtle body. And the uh, Anandamaya Kosha, the will or Chittam, is referred to as the Karana Sarira, the causal body. But he, here, Bhagavan is not using the word subtle body in that sense. He's, he, he says this ego is the subtle body. The reason he says this is it is often said that at the time of death, what leaves the body and goes on to take another life is the subtle body. But in, this con in that context, the subtle body is referring to ego or jiva. It is not referring to three of the five sheaves. Um, uh, what we what we take with us when we when we leave one body and go to another body is only our vasanas, our inclinations, which uh, constitute the karana sarira, the causal body, or the uh, ananda maya kosha. This is what we take with us. We leave everything else behind. So, but in this Karana Sarira, the reason it's called the Karana Sarira is the vasanas are the seeds that give rise to everything else. So we take all the five sheaves with us, but only in seed form, in the form of vasanas. So, but the, when it is said that it's the subtle body that transmigrates, it's not referring to three of the uh, five sheaves, it's referring to ego. That's why Bhagavan says ego is nupame, the subtle body. So we need to understand when we when the subtle body is used in Vedanta, the term subtle body is used in Vedanta, in Sanskrit it's usually sukshma sarira. There are two senses in which it is used. One sense, it refers to ego, that which moves, that which now identifies this body as I, 
and at the time of death of this body will go on to identify some other body as I. That's one sense. The other sense, the more usual sense, is, the, is that it's three of the five sheaves. Uh, but obviously in this context, it's not referring to three of the five sheaves because the, all the five sheaves are jada, they're devoid of awareness. So the chit jada granti is not the subtle body in that sense, it's the subtle body in the sense in, in this this sense, the sense of ego. Um, then the next term he uses is ego, a hande. Uh, then he says ichamsaram, this samsara. Samsara means the um, embodied existence, the, the, the perpetual cycle of birth and death. Um, the, why he says this ego is samsara it, there's no samsara independent of ego. So this I that rises as I am this body, where it rises the extent of a body, this is samsara. And it is also manam. When he says it is manam, mind, again, he's not referring to one of the five sheaves. Here, mind is used in the sense that, that is often when we talk when we talk about the mind, sometimes we use the term mind as a um, as a collective term to refer to the totality of all thoughts, all mental phenomena. But what is the essence of the mind? That is all all phenomena, all mental phenomena, but well, all phenomena are mental phenomena, and the all mental phenomena, all thoughts, exist in whose view? Only in the view of ego. So, when we talk about the mind as the subject, as the knower, that is ego. When we talk about mind as all the other thoughts, that is the other sense in which mind is used. So here he's refer he's using mind as a synonym for ego, in the sense it's the subject. Um, he clarifies this in verse 18 of Upadesha Undia, in which he says, um, uh, Enangle manam. Thoughts alone of a mind. Yavinum nanenum enname mulamam. Of all, meaning of all thoughts, the thought called I is the root. The thought called I means ego. The, why is it the root? Because it is no thoughts can arise without ego, because all thoughts arise only in the view of ego. So ego is the root of all other thoughts. And then he concludes by saying, therefore, well, he doesn't say therefore, but it's implied there. Therefore, uh, what is called I is the mind. What is called I means ego. So ego is the mind. So what the mind essentially is, is only the ego. All the other thoughts are just uh, an expansion of ego. That The other thoughts have no existence independent of ego. So ego is their root. And so what the mind essentially is, is only ego. Um, so um, I've explained this verse in detail. I'll just go through once more the meaning of the verse. Um, the insentient body does not say I. Such it, being awareness, does not rise. In between, one thing, I, rises as the extent of a body. This is chitjadagranti, bondage, jiva or soul, a subtle body, ego, this samsara, and mind. So what he, what he clarifies here is that ego is not such it, and it's not the body. But it is that it's something that rises between the two as the extent of a body. So it is it borrows certain it borrows its existence and its awareness from Satchit. Uh, that is the fundamental awareness I am, the awareness of being, that it borrows from Satchit. And it borrows its form from the body because it experiences itself as I am this body. So what we actually are is such it. So, but ego 
it borrows it, as I say, borrows its existence and awareness from Satchit and its form from the body. So it is neither Satchit nor is it the body, but something in between. So this is why I, I, from this we have to understand ego is a false awareness of ourself. Ego is an awareness of ourself as I am this body. So since it is a, an awareness of ourself as I am this body, it... Um, uh it um <clears throat> uh since yeah since it's uh, awareness of ourself as i am this body and since we this body is not what we actually are ego is therefore an erroneous awareness of ourself because why is the ego why is the body not ourself because it has no awareness at all so what is a, the body is an object of is something that we experience as an object. That is, though we though we uh, identify ourselves with this body, we still experience this body as an object. We can all the um, the physical form of this body is clearly an object. We can we can see our hands, our, um, and uh, we can. Touch, feel, it's an, it's an object, it's something that is presented to us in our awareness. Likewise, all the other sheaths, the prana, the, the life, the breathing, the, um, the heartbeat, all these other physiological functions that are the manifestation of life in the body, these are all objects known by us. The mind consisting of uh, perceptions, memories, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and so on, these are all objects known by us. The intellect and its workings are objects known by us. The vasanas and the, the likes, dislikes, desires, and so on that sprout from them, these are all objects known by us. They're all phenomena. But we are the subject. So the... the the subject cannot be an object, but that is the object of what the subject knows as something other than itself. But in the case of the, the body, in the case of these five sheaths, though as ego we experience all these things as objects, we nevertheless mistake them to be ourselves. Um, so uh, e ego is clearly an erroneous awareness of ourself. We are taking ourselves to be something other than what we actually are. So since ego is an erroneous awareness of ourself, it cannot be eradicated by any means other than correct awareness of ourself. Um, if, we see a, if we see a rope and mistake it to be a snake, the only way to get rid of that snake we can't we can't kill that snake by however many times we beat it with a stick, it's not going to die. But the only way to to kill that snake, the only way to free ourselves from that from a fear caused by that snake is to look at it carefully. If we look at it carefully and see what it actually is, that correct perception, or oh, this is a, a rope, will thereby remove the false perception, this is a, a snake. Likewise, this false awareness, I am this body, can be eradicated only by correct awareness of ourself. That is, awareness of ourself as we actually are. Sorry, that was a rather long answer to that, but I hope that helps to clarify that. Yeah, that was a very good answer, uh, Michael. I don't think you could do it any shorter to make people understand what that false yes. awareness is. Yes. Um, I had prepared some questions, um, but but some some a question arise spontaneously and i'm just going to ask yeah yes um and because the theme of today is or the, the key point is since ego is erroneous awareness of herself it can be eradicated only by correct awareness of herself which you explained which means awareness of herself as we actually are and you explained that the erroneous awareness is the false idea i am this body yes um so i want to i want to jump to verse 17 uh, which is uh, together with verse 18 mm -hmm. are the two verses that i'm i am doing a lot of manana on uh, yes. in the last couple of weeks whatever yeah and um, because you're you're explaining that we are not this body but in verse 17 uh, <laughs> bhagavan says for those who do not know themselves and for those who do the body is i i'm just going to read this this yes. short part so could you, I think it's a nice, 
it's a nice thing to to talk about because people have questions about this, of course, because yeah, we're also yeah. talking about the correct awareness of ourselves. Yeah. And here Bhagavan is saying the body is also I, but of course there's more to the story. So yes. if you're willing, yes. could you explain okay. the difference? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, that is, there's an element of humor in this in verse 18, because we all know Bhagavan's teaching is, I am not this body, this world is unreal. But in this verse, Bhagavan says, not only for the, for the Agnani, the person who do, does not know them, the one who does not know themselves, even for the Jnani, the one who knows them, what they actually are, the body is actually I. Why is he saying this? And in the next verse, he says, for both of them, the world is real. Uh, to understand this, if we just take this first sentence, um, uh, it will be confusing if we know Bhagavan's teaching, but he explains it in the next two sentences. What he says in the next two sentences, sorry, it, can I'll just say one thing, that is, he begins this uh, this uh, verse with the words udl nane. Udl means body, nan means I. But he doesn't just say I, he says nane. That A is an intensifying suffix. The exact meaning of that is, uh, is uh, can vary slightly according to the context. Here we can take it to mean actually, we can even take it to mean only. The body is only I. So uh, why does he say that? Why Not only for the Agni, and even for Vinyani, the body is only I. The reason is, as he says, for those who do not know themselves, I is only the extent of a body. In other words, for those who do not know themselves, I is limited to the extent of a body. As he says in verse 24, which we've just discussed, this ego rises as the extent of a body. In other words, it's limited to the extent of a body. The word limited is... He doesn't use in this sentence, but it's, uh, it's he says, Udl Alave, the extent of the body alone is I. So the I is limited to the, uh, uh, only to the extent of the body, is the implication. Um, and, and then in the next sentence, he says, Udl Ulaitan and Unandaku, for those who have known the, them, uh, for those who have known themselves um, within the body, that is, with it, that implies within the lifetime of this body, those who have known themselves, ele um, ara, devoid of limit, tan olirum, that tan means oneself, uh, nan means I. So, uh, for those who have known themselves within the body, oneself, I. So we, we have to take that as an apposition. Oneself, I, shines without limit. Olirum means shines. Ele is limit. Ara is without, without limit. So what is the implication here? For the Agnani, only the body is I. What he says in the first sentence, he words it very carefully. When he says, Udl nane, that means the body is only I, for both of them. But for the Agnani, only the body is I, whereas for the, for the Nyani, I shines without limit. Since I shines without limit, there cannot be any body other than I. So in that sense, the body is also I. Um, we can also... Um, understand this with uh, uh, an analogy. Supposing we're walking along a, a dark path with um, in the uh, dusk, it, there's um, faint light, but the light isn't very bright. We see something lying on the path, and Bhagavan is accompanying us. So we see something lying on the path, but to us looks suspiciously like a snake. So we... Um, we uh, we we are afraid on seeing it. So we say, Bhagavan, Bhagavan, look, there's a snake. Do you see it? Bhagavan say, yes, I see it. But Bhagavan sees what it actually is. He sees it as a rope. 
We see it as a snake. So Bhagavan is seeing the same that we are seeing, but he's seeing it, whereas we are seeing it as a, as a snake, he's seeing it as a rope. He's seeing it as it actually is. So in the view of Vinyani, I alone is what actually exists. So whatever we see as this body and world and all these other things is what the jnani sees as I. Because for the jnani, there is nothing other than I. I alone exists. So what we experience as many, the jnani experiences as one. And that one is I. But I alone is what actually exists. So since nothing other than I exists, if at all there's a thing called body, it cannot be anything other than I. So for Vinyani, the body is only I. Everything is only I, because there is only I. There's no everything. It's the implication. Is that a, a clear explanation? Uh, yes, thank you for that. Um, so could I... Yeah, yeah, Sadhuam used to put it very simply. For the Agnani, uh, the body is... Only the body is I. Or, uh, or I is only the body. For the jnani, I, uh, the body is also I. For the agnani, I alone is the, the body alone is I. For the jnani, the body is also I. Because there's nothing other than I. Yes, that, that, was, that was just what I wanted to say, yeah. if I could phrase it like that. Yeah. I, some, of course, if you're following this path and you're doing your manana, you're doing like thought experiments with yourself because you try to kind of imagine how how a yani experiences <laughs> a yana. Um, and so I experience myself at this moment limited to this body. But I feel myself as one body. It's not like my food is another body and and my head is another body. I yeah, mean, this yeah. is this is oneness. Yeah. And though I call it my food, I could my feet. I could see that as a name and a form. It's yeah. still my body. Yeah. Uh, could I kind of in that way um, uh, also think like so? Yani. Now I'm looking at my laptop, and that's that's clearly something different than myself. Yeah. Um, but just as I experience my foot as myself, Ayani experiences the laptop as himself, or it's not like a gender you explain. Could I could I do that thought experiment in that way, or am I, am I making um, a mistake? We need to be very, very careful. Firstly, we can't actually conceive what is the state of Ayani. Yes. Yeah. What we can say is, what we see as a, as a laptop is what Ayani sees as himself. Yeah, but that means the jnani, because the jnani experiences only is aware only of I, nothing other than I. The jnani is aware of oneness. So what yeah. we see as manyness, the jnani sees as oneness. We yes. shouldn't, we shouldn't think that the jnani is seeing the laptop and seeing the laptop also as I, and seeing the microphone and microphone is also I, and seeing the keyboard and the keyboard is also I. That is, as Bhagavan says in verse 13 of Uludunapadu, jnana mam tane me, uh, oneself who is jnana, awareness, alone is I. Nana vam jnanam jnana mam. Awareness which is many is ignorance. So we see, as we, there is what actually exists is only one thing. That is the pure awareness. We see that one thing as all this manyness, where the jnani sees it as one. So he's not seeing the many, he's seeing only one. If you say, if, if what is lying on the ground is a rope, you can say one person sees the rope as a snake. So um, if you, another person may see the rope as it is, so, uh, if the person who sees it as a snake asks the person who sees it as a rope, do you see it? They will say yes. But where is... Um, so, it seems to the person who is seeing it as a snake, this other person is also seeing the snake. So, but the, the other person will say, no, what you see as a snake is what I see as a rope. 
if you see the what is actually there is only a rope if you if you if you express it by saying i see the the rope as the snake as a rope what does that actually mean that means i don't see the snake at all i see only the rope because what is there is only a rope so we uh, we can you can literally see the a rope as a snake you can only metaphorically see the snake as a rope because there's no snake there at all there is only a rope so bhagavan is seeing the snake as a rope that means what we mistake to be this body and world all this multiplicity of phenomena is what bhagavan sees as one indivisible uh he says it beautifully in uh, verse 28 of upadesh undia if one knows what the nature of oneself is then anadi ananta akanda satchidananda that the implication is if we know what we actually are we will know ourselves to be anadi ananta satchidananda that's one one implication the other implication is if we know ourselves as we actually are then what will exist is only anadi ananta akanda satchidananda um so what is the meaning of anadi ananta uh, uh, uh satchidananda An- anadi means without beginning because it's beyond time it has no beginning and therefore it has no end An- ananta ananta literally means uh, without end but it also means with because a, a, a limit is an end um so uh ananta also means without limit in other words it means infinite so satchidananda is timeless it is infinite and it is akanda akanda means unbroken undivided because it is one it, you cannot do, so so long as we see the one as many we are not seeing it as it actually is when we see it as it actually is we will see it as one not as many so if we say the jnani sees the many as one that means the jnani is not seeing the many at all he see he or she is seeing only the one yeah so because one uh, alone is what actually exists yeah uh, coming back to the example i used of looking at my laptop i see that as other than myself yes. and if i'm correct because sometimes i have to think about what you're saying you said well bhagavan would see the laptop as just uh, there's only oneness he wouldn't uh, see it as other he, well is he, he doesn't see the laptop at all what we yeah, yeah. see as a laptop he sees as himself yeah okay uh, there, there's another important verse in this context is um verse 31 um what bhagavan uh, uh says here is um tanne aritu arunda tanmaya nandaku um tanmaya nanda means happiness composed of that that here refers to brahman so tanmaya nanda is the happiness that is brahman happiness that is our own real nature but in tamil if you add an r at the end of a noun it makes it it's a a respectful personal noun so tammayananda means uh one who is tammayananda one who is that happiness and and tammayananda ku means to one who is happiness to, to one who is that happiness composed of brahman which rises destroying oneself that is when uh when um when this when we experience ourselves as this uh tammayananda which implies the same as satchidananda um when we experience ourselves as that that will kill ourself ourself means ego so tanaya ritum uh destroying oneself implies destroying ego um so for those who experience uh themselves as tammayananda for those who who are tammayananda uh enne uldu ondru irku what what single thing is there to do 
that implies there's nothing for them to do because their nature is pure being. There's nothing for pure being to do. The nature of pure being is just being, not doing anything. But then the, in, the sentence that is relevant to what we've been talking about is the next one. Tanne aladu anyam ondru ariya. That means they do not know anything. Ondrum here means anything. Uh, anyam. Anyam means other. Tanne uh, aladu. Except themselves. They do not know anything other than... In other words, they do not know anything other than themselves. In other words, what what Vinyani knows is only themselves. Not, only they know I and I alone, nothing other than I. And then he say he ends the verse by saying, "Ava nile me inadu endru unal evan." That means, um, who can conceive their state as like this? It's it's not like anything. There's nothing we in the do means it is such, but we can't. Um, uh, it's beyond conception. A state in which nothing other than ourself exists is a, is a state that cannot be conceived by the mind because the mind only knows multiplicity. It cannot. It cannot. We cannot form a conception of a state in which there's nothing other than ourself. We that we may. We, we we may have some vague idea, but we are not we are, we cannot know it as it actually is. In order to know it as it actually is, we need to be that. Only by being Tanmayananda can we know Tanmayananda. And being Tanmayananda means being the only thing that actually exists. Yeah. Yeah. So he's very, very explicit here. They do not know anything other than themselves. Yeah. Well, 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 when I'm doing, of course, my Shravana and Manana and Nidijasana, yeah. um, I, for example, uh, I brought this example up because I'm aware, for example, that some people following this path might think if there is only one, one without a second, they have mm -hmm. the assumption that if they see other people who are seemingly aware, that if they would experience oneness, they kind of are also aware what everyone is thinking or feeling or experiencing, as if you're kind of a yes. Um, how what's the word for that? But someone who's psychic and in that way, yeah. But that's I, I, that's a wrong assumption, of course. No, it, so it is. So yeah. long as we see more than one, we are in the state of ignorance. That's why. Yeah. But so. But, in in as I referred earlier to verse thirteen of Uludunapadu, in which Bhagavan says "nana vam jnanam ajnanamam," that is that literally means awareness which is many is ignorance. So, what does he mean by awareness which is uh, many? Uh, when he the day he composed this verse, he first composed it in a slightly different form. Then he modified it in order to pack more meaning into it. In the original verse, he said, Jnanam Andre Unme, uh, awareness alone is real. Nana Vaikan Kindra Jnanam Agnanam. That is, the awareness that sees as many is ignorance. Because what actually exists is only one. That one awareness alone exists. So that which sees that one awareness as many, that is ignorance. So yeah. so long as we see multiplicity, so long as we see manyness, we are that is ignorance. So manyness appears only in the view of ego. So and, and we experience things other than ourselves only when we experience ourselves as a body. As Bhagavan makes clear in verse four of Uludunapadu, uh, Uruvam Tanayin Ulu Paramatran. If one's self is a form, the world and God will be likewise. If one's self is not a form, who can see their forms and how? So they, that uh, um, the the second sentence, who can see their uh, if if one's self is not a form, who can see their forms as uh, and how? That is a rhetorical question. If we, the clear implication means if we don't if we don't experience ourselves as a form, 
we cannot experience other forms. So forms appear only in the view of the awareness that mistakes itself to be a form, in other words, ego. So from the very outset, from right at the beginning of Uludin Afri, but when you make it very, very clear, all this form, that is, when we see multiplicity, we are seeing many forms. Forms here means anything that is distinguishable from anything or other thing is a form. So it's not just referring to physical forms. Every thought is a form. Every feeling is a form. All phenomena are forms. So only when we mistake ourselves to be a phenomenon, namely this body consisting of five sheaths, are we aware of other phenomena. If we don't experience ourselves as a phenomenon, who can see all the, that how to see and who can see all the, those all phenomena? There are no phenomena at all. It's a clear implication. I mean, he ends that verse by saying, one self is the eye, the infinite eye. All forms are finite. So the infinite eye, uh, I means E-Y-E, it, he's using that word, the Tamil word is kan, meaning the, the, the physical organ eye, but he's using it here metaphorically to refer to awareness. So when he says we are the infinite eye, he means we are infinite awareness. Infinite awareness knows only infinitude. It cannot know forms. It's only the, the awareness that limits itself as a form, namely ego, that sees forms. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm. Well, I just brought that example up of um, um, people who have a concept about what oneness is, and yeah, yeah, for exactly. example, for example, thinking that other people seeming seeming other people who are aware, if yes. they if they would. Um, uh, if they would have eradicated ego, they would be kind of co conscious or aware of what everyone who seem to yes. be everyone is thinking. Yes. So because that is a um, um, conceptual mistake, I'm also wondering, of yes. course, if yeah, I am yeah, doing yeah. something like looking at my laptop and kind of trying to imagine how I experience it, unfortunately, and how yeah, yeah. Bhagavan would experience it if I'm making a uh, also a conceptual mistake. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so that's some, why I've some people imagine ice, that they are seeing everything as God. But that's yeah. only a, you can consider everything to be God. Bhagavan refers to that in verse 5 of Rupadesh Undia, where he says, uh, considering all the eight forms to be forms of God, uh, sorry, worshipping, considering all the eight forms to be forms of God, is good worship of God. The word he uses there is any. Any means thinking or considering. So we can consider everything to be God. That, that's a good attitude to have, because if we consider everything to be God, then we that helps us go beyond likes and dislikes. Go, it helps us um, rise above selfishness. So we, and if, for example, if we see a person in distress and we help that person, we are helping them because we see them as God. So we, are, we, are, we, we should feel blessed for, give, to be given that opportunity of serving them. But that is all a mano bhava. It's all a mental uh, bhava. It, it's, a, it's, it's a mental conception. We're not, we cannot actually see everything as God so long as we see everything. Because God is one. So long as we see many, we are not seeing God. And likewise, on this, on the, on this path of jnana, there are people who think, oh, I see everything as myself. Uh, th therefore, I have no problems. So long as you see everything, you don't see yourself as you actually are. Because what sees everything is only ego. That is what Bhagavan refers to as the nana vam jnanam. Ego is that that awareness that sees itself as many. Sean has a question, I think. Yes, this is reminding me of when um, Bhagavan is said to have said, do I eat with only this mouth? Meaning like there's other mouths that Bhagavan is eating with. And also incidentally, it's reminding me of like um, seeing Christ in the poor, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, yeah. That, that is the context in which Bhagavan said that. When people try to give something special to Bhagavan, if someone brings, uh, uh, for example, some sweets or some fruit or something, some eatables to be uh, to to offer to Bhagavan, Bhagavan will always insist that it's offered equally to everyone. And if there's not enough to go round, he will insist others are given and not himself. So once when someone said, but Bhagavan, they brought it specially for you, but you're not eating it, you're just giving it to others. That's a type of reprimand. Bhagavan, isn't that cruel of you to, to not to accept that gift is the implication. But Bhagavan, in that context, Bhagavan says, am I eating only through one mouth? That's the, that he's teaching us there, but he exists equally in everyone. So whatever we offer to anyone, we are offering to him. But again, this is all... This, the, the teaching Bhagavan gave us there is that we should look upon everything as God. That's the implication. But that is still only... That's not an experience. That's just an attitude that we have. It's a good attitude to have. But we shouldn't delude ourselves, but we're actually seeing everything as Bhagavan. We're considering everything to be Bhagavan. Not actually seeing it. In order to see everything as Bhagavan, we need to see ourselves as Bhagavan. When we see ourselves as Bhagavan, we will see, since Bhagavan alone exists, we will not see anything other than ourselves. And C, C can also be, it can also be said experience. C means, yes, C, C yeah. here it means to, to uh, cognize, to perceive. Yeah. yeah. In Recently. that context, Bhagavan said, true seeing is being. Yeah. That is only by being that pure awareness are we truly seeing. Uh, what, are we seeing what is real? You, we, uh, as he says in verse 26 of Upadesh Undia, Tanai iritle tanai aritlam. Being oneself alone is knowing oneself. Because we can never know ourselves as an object. So we can know ourselves only by being ourselves. And being ourselves means being as we actually are without rising as ego. That's why he says in verse 27 of Uludunapdu, the state in which I is without rising is the state in which we are that. That is, in order to experience ourselves as that, that meaning Brahman, we need to be without rising. And how to be without rising? He says, without investigating the place where I rise is, how to be in one's own, how to be without rising. I'll just get exactly what he says there. Um, without investigating the place where I rise is, how to reach the annihilation of oneself in which I does not rise. So in order to, to be as we actually are, in order to be that, we need to be without rising as I. And in order to be without rising as I, we need to investigate the place where I rises. In other words, we need to investigate ourselves, the source from which this I has risen. I, um, you referred earlier to the new homepage of my website. I yeah. give quite a detailed um, explanation of this verse because it's a very, very important verse. I give it detailed explanation on that um, that new home page. Beautiful, yeah. Well, I think with our talk and your explanation that we cover the questions that I had, yeah. uh, because I wanted to, to ask you how to eradicate the erroneous awareness, but you already said that, something about it unless well, you he, that, that like verse, elaborate. Bhagavan says it clearly in that verse that yeah. rhetorical question uh, um, um, without investigating the place where I rises 
the place where I rise is I only can only rise from us that is, I rises uh, the I, the I that rises is ego. It rises in waking and dream. It subsides in sleep. So it can only rise from that which exists in sleep. What exists in sleep is only ourself as we actually are, our own being. So that is the source from which I rise. Our, in other words, the pure awareness I am is the source from which the false awareness I am this body arises. So without investigating that uh, pure awareness I am is the implication, how to attain the annihilation of oneself, the state in which I does not rise. Regarding looking to the place where I rises, I have a brief question. Yes. I was recently reading a new book and it defines Atmavachara as self-inquiry. It usually denotes the practice of self-inquiry taught by Ramana Maharshi, who advocated inquiring into our being subjectively aware of the individual but false sense of I. And that seems to me to be mistaken because what, as you say, what we're actually looking into is the source of I. That You can look at I, but that's a snake, not the rope. And the rope is what is real. And what we want to attend to is our being. Well, they're not... There are not two eyes. That, that is, if there were two things, a snake and a rope, we could choose whether to attend to the snake or to the rope. But since what seems to be a snake is only a rope, if you look at what seems to be a snake, if you look at it carefully enough, you'll see, oh, it's only a rope. So to insist that we have to look only at the ego, not, I mean, if you say, if you insist that it has to be the individual eye you investigate, that's like saying, look at the snake, don't look at the rope. It's an impossible instruction. Because there's only one eye to look at. In, now that one eye seems to be ego, but what it actually is, is pure awareness. Just like they're not two things, a snake and a rope, they're not two eyes, an ego and pure awareness. What seems to be ego is pure awareness. What seems to be a snake is only a rope. Well, the, the same book I was reading, it says, let the monkey mind jump. It is no problem. Just watch it. And it seems to me that, that just watching is focusing on something that isn't I. Yes. What, what we're meant yes. yeah. But if we talk about the mind jumping, that is the, it's jumping in relation to other things. It's jumping, catching other things. So if you're watching, what is jumping is something other than ourself. What we shouldn't be watching what is jumping. We should be watching the being. In verse 17 of Upadesha India, Bhagavan says, Manatin Uruve Maravadu Chava. If one investigates the form of the mind without forgetting, it'll be clear there's no such thing as mind at all. So what does he mean there by manatin uru, the form of the mind? Their form implies swarupa, the real nature of the mind. That's our being. In the previous verse, he defines what is real awareness. Uh, verse 16 of Upadeshundir, he says, um, veli virengale vitu, leaving or letting go of external phenomena. In other words, ceasing to attend to anything other than ourself. Uh, um, manam tan oli uru ordale, the mind knowing its own form of light. The mind's form of light is the pure awareness. So in the next verse, when he talks about investigating the form of the mind, it clearly implies the mind's form of light. The mind's form of light is not the individual eye, it's the pure awareness. And he's, he very carefully, that is, when we look at these verses, that every word Bhagavan uses is very significant. In that verse 16 of Upadesha India, he said, the mind knowing its own form of light, its form of light implies pure awareness. So how can the mind know pure awareness? 
Obviously, the mind, Bhagavan makes it very clear. Pure awareness cannot be known by anything other than pure awareness. So why does he say here the mind knowing pure awareness? When the mind knows its form of light, it ceases to be mind and remains as that form of light, that pure awareness. And that alone is unmayunachi, that alone is real awareness. So the destruction of the mind is brought about by the mind seeing its real nature. But as soon the mind cannot, the mind as mind cannot see its real nature. Because as soon as it sees its real nature, it, the pure awareness, it ceases to be mind and remains as pure awareness. So that to understand verse 16 correctly, we need to, we need to read it in the light of a previous verse. verse sorry, in order to understand verse 17 correctly, we need to understand, read in, in, um, in the light of the previous verse, verse 16 where he talks about uh, manam tan oli uru, its form of light. So when he says in verse 17, manatin uru, he's clearly implying the mind's form of light. He's not talking about jumping mind. He's talking about what the mind essentially is, which is that pure awareness I am. Yeah, another concern I have of it's, is it's re referencing the witness or what is watching. And... You brought this up with Ian McNay a long time ago in the Conscious TV interview, and I thought it was very insightful because I personally haven't heard anyone else talk about it, which is that the I who is watching the thoughts itself is a thought. Yes, that's, that's one of one basic teachings. Ego is a thought. Because if ego were not a thought, how could it know thoughts? According to what Bhagavan says in verse 4 of Vulizunapati, I was referring to earlier, if one's self is a form, the world and God will be likewise. If one's self is not a form, who can see their forms and how? Can what is seen be otherwise than what sees? When he said, can it, the, the literal meaning of that sentence is, can, can what is seen be otherwise than the eye? I mean E-Y-E. Uh, what that implies is, can what is known be of a different nature to what knows? So only the I that is a thought can know thoughts. According to Bhagavan, everything except Satchit is a thought. Except the pure awareness I am, everything is a thought. Since ego is the that pure awareness I am, mixed and conflated with adjuncts, as I am this body, the body is a thought. So the, 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 the awareness that is completed with a thought is also a thought. So Bhagavan never recommended that we watch the jumping mind. He says, yeah, what do you matter however many thoughts rise? As and when each thought rises, we need to investigate to whom it rises. Investigate to whom it rises means we need to turn our attention away from the thought, back towards ourself, the one to whom it appears. Because Bhagavan also defines Atma Vachara, you pointed out to me, and Sandra knew it as well, in Nanar as always keeping the mind on oneself. Yes. And that means it, it, oneself it, is Atma, not Jiva. <laughs> Well, it, again, it doesn't matter. In the word Atma Vichara, does that Atma refer to, um, to the real self or to the false self? There's only one self. There's only one self, exactly. But I, I don't find By I all means, don't find investigate the false focus self. On the false self. Sorry? I, I'm sorry. I personally don't find it helpful to say focus on the false self. That seems strange to me. Well, it, it sometimes Bhagavan, when people sometimes in books like Talks and Day by Day, there are people who ask Bhagavan, Bhagavan, in who am I? What is the I I should investigate? Bhagavan says ego. Why does he say that? Because anyone who asks that question, they're thinking and they're thinking there's one I that I know and some other I that I don't know. 
So which eye should I focus on? Focus on the eye you know. So if someone asks, if, if, you, if Bhagavan tells someone, it's not a snake, it's only a rope, look at it carefully. If they then ask Bhagavan, which it should I look at? Should I look at the snake or at the rope? What is Bhagavan going to say? If he says, look at the rope, but I don't know the rope. So what do he say? He, he brings them to what? Look at the snake. If you look at the snake, what do you see? Oh, it's only a rope. So it's true. There are places where Bhagavan does say, it, it, the eye in who am I is ego. But we need to understand why he says that. It's because of the... the it, every answer Bhagavan gives is appropriate to the question that is asked. If you ask which eye should I attend to, you've obviously got an idea that there's more than one eye. So Bhagavan will say, attend to the only eye you know, attend to ego. If you attend to ego, what do you see? Oh, there's no such thing as ego, there's only pure awareness. What I mean, seemed so my to be question... pure e ego was only pure awareness. My question is, what about, with all due respect, what about people who have been studying this for many, many years, focusing on the false eye, and so far as I can tell, never discovering the substratum? Aren't we meant to focus on ourself, on reality, not on something well, false, supposedly? It, so long as we still think in terms of two eyes, but if I look at this false eye, some new eye will rise up or something, that is, this is the path of jnana, the path of knowledge, of awareness. We, we cannot investigate ourselves correctly without a correct understanding. So if we still got a woolly understanding about what the practice is, our practice is not going to be, it's maybe not completely useless because we, we may be getting close to it, but it's not a, if we're really practicing this, we will clearly understand there are no two eyes. One eye to look for another eye. Or there's no new eye that is going to suddenly appear. There's only one eye. What we now experience as I is the pure awareness I am, mixed and conflated with adjuncts. When we attend to the pure, to the, to the I am portion of this, adjunct conflated awareness, I am this body, the body will drop off and the pure eye alone will remain. In Maharshi's gospel, Bhagavan said very, very clearly, he explained that ego is chit chat granti. And he says, in your investigation into the source of the ahambriti, ahambriti is another term for ego, you take the essential chit aspect of ego. So, when he said you take you, we have to investigate the essential chit aspect of ego. Is the essential chit aspect of ego the real eye or the false eye? Is it the individual eye? No, it's obviously not. He's telling us in that individual eye, you attend to the what is real. That is the pure awareness I am. On this subject, you reminded me of one more thing. Um, in in regard to there only being one eye, and we are that. That's the whole point. That's the practice. Um, I subsides and the true I, you know, there's only one I, a true I reveals itself as I am, which is eternal yeah. and always present, shining yeah. and everything. But in relation to this, um, some people um, are looking for outward yanis. Lot, lots of us are looking for outward yanis. Yes. And um, you pointed out something to me. I emailed you about this and you pointed out um, some verses that I personally, I don't think I'd ever read, or if I did, it would be a long time ago, but I don't think I knew of them from Sadhu Om about um, who was the Nyani. Would you please talk about that? Um, yes, I'll have to find that. Um, it's a very nice poem. It's part of Sadhana Saram. That is the reason Sadhu Om wrote this, um, wrote this song is because people are always, it, there's a lot of curiosity about whether this person or that person is a Nyani. And people think that if you if you go and sit in the presence of a jnani, um, it, it, uh, you, you'll automatically go within or whatever. So people are looking. Bhagavan's teaching is look within. But people don't want to look within, so they want to look for the jnani outside. Sometimes when people ask Bhagavan whether such and such a person is a jnani, Bhagavan said, there's only one jnani, you are that. 
know yourself and you know jnana. So we can't find jnana outside ourselves. Jnana mam tane me, he says in verse 13 of Uludunaftu. One self who is jnana alone is real. So what Sadhuam says in this, um, I'll just read the English meaning because uh, it's actually it's very, very deep uh, meaning I could explain, but I, it would take too long to explain in, in full. Is the intellect that decides this person is a jnani, that person is an agnani, is that intellect jnana or agnana? The implication is that the intellect that is distinguishing one one person from another person is only agnana. The jnani alone exists, and hence is only one, not many. Therefore, even the jnani seen by the ignorant mind that sees jnanis as many people is only a product of that ignorance. You yourself are a mere thought. That means you as ego are a mere thought. Therefore, for the person who is said by you, this first thought, to be a holy person or a mahatma is just one among your thoughts. How can that thought, which is an illusory product of maya, be the apma parinyani, the pure uh, transcendent knower of self? Um, even saying... This person is a good soul, a jnani we know is untrue. Saying all people are jnanis is also untrue, because seeing as if many exist is a definitive sign of ignorance. Only one actually exists, you are that. Um, to the jnani, there is no agnani, because in the view of the jnani, no person or anything else other than uh, than oneself alone, oneself actually exists. The jnani applies the name jnani, sorry, the agnani applies the name jnani only to a body. By this mistaken view that sees the jnani as a body, the agnani sees the jnani merely as an agnani. That is, the, agni, the jnani is not a body, the implication. Even though you may go to however many Mahatmas, and even though any of them may exist, exhibit the Ashta Siddhi, the Eightfold Supernatural Powers, know that whoever turns you inwards to investigate yourself, saying, instead of letting your mind spread out in pursuit of such juggleries, become inward facing, alone is a true Mahatma. So the true ma the implication is the true Mahatma will not say, come to me, I will give you jnana. The true jnani will say, you are already that, see yourself. Bhagavan clearly said, the jnani cannot give anything that you don't already have. All the jnani can do is to tell you to see, your, to see that you're already that. Um, yeah, and, and that's why I feel like when we already have Bhagavan, there's no need to go to other gurus because exactly, he's already exactly. giving you the pristine teaching. But Bhagavan is dead, so I need to go and find the living guru, people think. But Bhagavan is not dead. If we think Bhagavan is dead, we haven't done this. We are taking Bhagavan to be a body. And if we go to some other living guru, we'll take that living guru to be a body. And Sadhu Om used to say, when people said, is a living guru necessary? He said, yes, a living guru is absolutely necessary. But if, you, if what you mean by living guru is a living body, then your living guru will one day become a dead guru. Such a living guru is useless. We want an ever-living guru. The ever-living guru is Bhagavan, because he's not the body. Um... Then he goes on, may the Atman, meaning the Jivatma, who goes into the vast Himalayas and forests seeking Mahatmas, instead of becoming Sukhatma Swarupa, the, the eternally blissful real nature, by going within seeking where it itself is, um, or... May, may the Atman which goes in, into a vast Himalayas and forests seeking Mahatmas, 
May they instead become Sukhatma Swarupa by going within, seeking where it itself is. All the Mahatmas who have previously appeared in front, as if they were other people, will then be known to be Swarupa, one's own real nature. This is what Bhagavan said. Um, before one knows oneself, one's self-knowing uh, the real nature of tapasvis, um is not in any way possible. Therefore, give up all futile efforts to know who is a real jnani. Cling only to the exalted effort, namely Atma Vichara, that will destroy the illusory awareness of yourself as a jiva. Um, if any thought rises in you hereafter, wanting to know whether someone is a jnani or an agnani, rejecting it immediately by turning within, investigating it immediately, fix your attention and merge only in the source yourself from which that thought arose. Um, give up trying to determine whether these people are jnanis or agnanis. Oh, sorry. Giving up trying to determine whether these people are uh, jnanis or agnanis, when one investigates who is the one who perceives them as existing, it will be clear that it is I. So investigate who is this I who rises. The true jnani will then shine forth, implying the true jnani will shine forth as yourself. Um, and then he says, whoever may be a jnani, what is it to us? So long as we do not know ourselves, it will be of no benefit. If we investigate, jnana alone is the jnani. This is Bhagavan, jnana me jnani. This is something Bhagavan often used to say. Uh, uh, it is not a human form. He puts it beautifully in Tamil. Jnana me jnani, nara vadivu andru. That is the... When, he, when Bhagavan says jnani alone, jnana alone is the jnani, jnana means pure awareness. Jnani means what knows pure awareness. What can know pure awareness? Only pure awareness. So jnana alone is the jnani. jnana. Jnana, the jnani is not a human form. It is only the transcendent space of pure awareness. If we are that form, uh, we, we, are, we are that form. I said, we are that pure awareness. Therefore, by self-investigation, Atma Vichara, annihilate the petty mind that seeks to know whether this person or that person is a jnani. The correct way to see the jnani is seeing by means of silence, um, a state in which the mind doesn't rise, that only jnana, that only jnana, which being one, does not rise and jump out as I am this, is the jnani. So long as we see any other person as a jnani, so long as we're seeing otherness, what sees otherness is only ego. So we cannot know. It's useless looking for jnanis outside ourselves. As Bhagavan said, we ourselves are jnana. If we want to find jnani, we can only find it within ourselves. Oh, but didn't Bhagavan say satsang is necessary? People say, yes. And Bhagavan also said the best satsanga is Atma Sangha, the association with oneself. Because what is, where is Sat? Sat is not out there, Sat is in here. Those were some very, very beautiful verses. Yes. Shall, I put the, shall I put the link in the description box? Oh, yeah, uh, sure. For people sure. to read. Yeah. yeah. Sean, do you still have a follow-up question on that? Well, yeah, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, the book also talks about the subject is pure awareness, and it could be it's just um, semantic. But um, it, you divide, uh, you know, subject, object. Subject is, there's subject and there's objects, and subject is ego. And this book says subject is pure awareness. And when you're aware of other things, when this pure awareness becomes aware of an object, that object becomes real. This gives rise to objective reality. But of course, that couldn't be pure awareness if it's aware of an object. 
no, obviously not. Obviously not. Pure awareness is not the subject. Pure awareness is the reality of subject. The subject is the false awareness, I am this body. Pure awareness is the I am awareness. So the, the subject without adjuncts is pure awareness. So we, yes, many people confuse this. They think pure awareness is, is what knows. Pure awareness doesn't know anything other than pure awareness. That's why it's pure. Awareness that has content, awareness that has objects of knowledge is not pure. Yeah, and in just one more point, I'm sorry. In context, I mean, there's a lot of good in the book. But um, in context, the person is referring to the mind, but just I think Michael is really known for his clarity and uh, like you're also said, being meticulous, which I like. But uh, they wrote here, where was the world in your sleep? When consciousness rises, that is creation. When it subsides, that is destruction. Again, in context, it's referring to the mind, but the word uses consciousness. And once again, you're, you're really keen on clarity. Yeah, well, um... Even Bhagavan sometimes uses the word consciousness to refer to mind. In verse 7 of um, Uludu Napadu, the word he uses is arivu. Arivu means awareness. So what he says in this verse is, though the world and awareness arise and subside simultaneously, the world shines by awareness. As soon as he says the awareness arise and subside, what is the awareness that arises and subsides? It's only ego or mind. But he, so we, when we read Bhagavan, we have to understand what he means. So because Bhagavan is writing poetry here, he's expecting us to, to think about it and make sense of it. If we take it that the real awareness is right, in another in verse 24, the verse we were talking right at the beginning, he says, Satchitu diadu. Satchit, that is, the being awareness does not rise. So the awareness that rises is not the real awareness, it's only the mind. So what he says in this verse is, though the world and awareness arise and subside simultaneously, the world shines by awareness. So him, awareness means mind. And then he goes on to say, only that which shines without appearing and disappearing as the base for the appearing and disappearing of the world and awareness is uh, poral, the substance, the real substance, which is pundram, the, the purna, the whole. So um, because Bhagavan's writing poetry and because Uludu Nabudu is designed to make us think, it, Bhagavan, it's okay for Bhagavan to say like that. But if when we are trying to explain what Bhagavan means, we need to be more, we need to be clearer, we need to be more precise. We need to say he uses awareness there, but though he uses awareness, it, he's not talking about the real awareness, he's talking about the false awareness. In verses 10 to um, 10, 11, and 12, he's constantly talking about uh, awareness, but he's, we, we need to understand where he's referring to the real awareness and where he's referring to the false awareness. He says in verse 12, the awareness that is devoid of awareness and ignorance is awareness. That, this is to make us think. The when he says awareness and ignorance, he's talking about knowledge and ignorance of the world, that which knows the world or doesn't know, uh, that knows or doesn't know, that's all a function of the mind. But the, the real awareness is devoid of both knowing and not knowing. He says, he explains it beautifully in verse 27 of Upadesha Undia. The, the, the awareness that is devoid of uh, not knowing and not knowing is true awareness because there's nothing to know. Arivadaku Andrile. There's nothing, 
The implication is for pure awareness, there's nothing other for it than itself for it to know. So what knows anything other than itself is not the real awareness. Thank you, Michael. So we, we can't say that person who said that, we can't say they're wrong, but whether we, uh, it's not a clear way of expressing it. Yeah, I think it's a good book, just minimally, I think in terms of clarity, you're much more beneficial in terms of being very clear, but people people are getting quite devotional towards this person, which I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I believe um, Janaki Mata, this is a story I read online, so I don't know if it's true, but supposedly she went to Bhagavan and she said, Bhagavan, I'm worried because I have devotees and I know like you're the true guru, something like this. And he said, don't worry if they're worshiping you, they're really worshiping me. And that's like Krishna. Yes, yes. That is, it's only a problem if we ident if someone worships us, if we identify ourselves, I am this person who is being worshipped, then it's a problem. But Bhagavan is, don't identify yourself as this person. That is the implication of what Bhagavan is saying there. If she said that's a problem, if she took that to be a problem, that means she's still taking herself to be that person. Okay. Thanks a lot, Michael. I'll let right. Sandra continue. I'm sorry. So we can proceed with the questions asked in the announcement video. Um, the first, I do it in the order that they were submitted there. Um, the first question I want to say, it was also a topic in the newly uh, founded Facebook group, Sri Ramana Teachings. Uh, Sri Ramana Teachings. Um, and it might be that you answered it in the previous meeting with um, uh, UK. Um, the question is, vasanas do not exist in deep sleep. So what vasanas do we start with the next morning? Um, vasanas do not, vasanas are inclinations. Whose inclinations are they? They are ego's inclinations. So in the absence of ego, vasanas cannot exist. But when ego rises again the next morning, it rises along with all its vasanas. Regarding um, that is, ego doesn't exist in sleep, but it hasn't been destroyed, so it rises again. That is, sleep is a state of manolaya. Manolaya means dissolution of mind. So ego is completely dissolved in sleep, or any other state of manolaya, but because it is not destroyed, it will rise again. Why is ego not destroyed? Because in the case of sleep, we fall asleep because of tiredness. So when we, when we subside in sleep, ego subsides, and when ego subsides, what remains is pure awareness. But ego doesn't experience itself as pure awareness because it's absent, because it's already subsided. So it's not destroyed, so it will rise again. That's the same case with any uh, manole, even Nivikalpa Samadhi. You can go into Nivikalpa Samadhi by pranayama and other yoga exercises. But because you go into that state by some means other than seeing yourself as pure awareness, it is manolaya, and therefore the mind will rise again. In order to bring about manonasa, destruction of mind, the mind needs to see itself as pure awareness. This is what Bhagavan implies in verse 16 of Upadesh Undiya that I spoke about earlier. The mind seeing its own form of light. Only when the mind it's experiences, it, mind means here ego, of course, when ego experiences itself as pure awareness, then only is it destroyed, because as soon as it sees itself as pure awareness, ego is the false awareness, I am this body. When it sees itself as the pure awareness, I am, that identification is thereby destroyed. Ego is destroyed by seeing itself as pure awareness. So as soon as ego sees itself as pure awareness, it ceases to be ego and remains as pure awareness. Because what knows pure awareness is only pure awareness. We can know pure awareness only by being pure awareness. 
So when though ego subsides in sleep or nirvikalpa samadhi or coma or any state of manolaya, because it, it has subsided by some means other than seeing itself as pure awareness, it will rise again. So that state is just a state of manolaya. When ego rises, it rises along with all its vasanas. Is that a clear answer to that question? I think that's a clear answer, but I would like to suggest, as I said earlier, that it might be very interesting to watch the the video of the UK, the previous one, the latest one. Right. Because there is also the question uh, asked. Uh, it's yes. it's the first segment about that, 40 that minutes. That question yeah. was not specifically about Vasanas, but it's uh, it's actually going a bit deeper than this question about Vasanas. It is. And uh, 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 the question then started with how did ego rise from sleep or something yes, similar. Yes. Yeah. But I remember there was a part where then the question uh, arose about yeah. the, the vasanas. Yeah, I think I so, referred to the vasanas. On the... Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for that answer, Michael. The second right. question um, is... Um, if I understood, understand it correctly, we have a choice. One, we rise as ego and experience phenomena, but the price to pay is unsatisfaction, mix of happiness and unhappiness, dukkha. Two, be as really are, Satchit Ananda, and be completely happy, but pray to pay, but um, the price to pay is that we will not experience any phenomena. Since we are still attached to phenomena, we are not willing to let them go yet. So we are unhappy and it is our own, uh, it is only our fault. To be willing to let phenomena go, we need to practice self-attention as much as possible. And slowly our attachment to phenomena will decrease and also our love to be as we really are will increase. Do I understand it correctly? I like this question. So I'm very, very interested in your reply. <laughs> I can give a very simple reply, one word <laughs> reply, yes. Because the question is, do I understand it correctly? Yes, this is a correct <laughs> understanding. Yes. But one one thing I was reminded of when uh, somehow the wording of a question reminded me, Bhagavan talking about surrender, he says he said, our lack of willingness to surrender is like a poor person who has only a... a Quarter paisa, that was the smallest coin in those days. Uh, the, uh, who has a, uh, a quarter paisa who is offered all the, 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 uh, offered the whole universe, all the wealth in the universe, if they're willing to surrender that quarter paisa and still being unwilling to surrender that quarter paisa. That is what we are asked to let go of, ego and all these phenomena, is so, so trivial. It's not even comp comparable to a quarter paisa. It's so trivial. And what we are being offered in return is that infinite eternal happiness, which is what we always actually are. But we're still unwilling to let go. How foolish we are. That is why constant practice is necessary, because only by constant practice Will we strengthen the sattvasana, the love to be as we actually are, and weaken the vishaya vasana, the inclination to experience anything other than ourself? So yes, the, as I say, simple answer to that question is yes. It, it's very, it's uh, perfectly correct what is that person has understood. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? Yes. Because. Um unless I interpret it wrongly, of course, but it seemed to me that in, in one of the recent videos you did, um, if we're talking about uh, giving up phenomena and experiencing ourselves currently as this body, um, people are continuously, of, continuously trying to interpret what it means. And it seems to me that one um, person was saying, well, that would mean that I would have to give up my breathing because you could see breath is part of the the five sheets and therefore jada so 
that seems, of course, very, very, very radical if if that would be interpreted in that way. I have to give up my breathing. In other words, it would kill myself. And how can I give up my breathing? Do you understand my question? Yeah, I understand your question. Um, yeah. Wh whose breathing is it? Breathing belongs to the body. The, the dharma of the body is breathing. So let the deep body do its dharma. Let it breathe. We shouldn't interfere with that. The problem is that we have taken the body's dharma, the nature of the body to be our nature. So we think breathing is necessary. Breathing is certainly necessary for the body. So let the body breathe. Why should we take this body to be ourselves? So our aim is to give up the false identification, I am this body. So let's not worry about breathing or anything else. Who is it? How to give up this false identification? This, as Bhagavan made clear, this is a false awareness of ourself. So in order to remove this false awareness, I am this body, all we need to do is to be aware of ourselves as we actually are. So let's not worry about the breathing or eating food, all these things. This is the dharma of the body. Let the body do its dharma. Our dharma, our swadharma, our own dharma, is being as we actually are. In order to be as we actually are, we must cease concerning ourselves with anything else. We must cease attending to anything else. We must attend to ourselves alone. Yes, that was a very helpful clarification of that because people can go really all over the place, of course, trying to interpret giving up phenomena. <laughs> yes. And um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. Can we continue let with phenomena the phenomena? Yeah. Let phenomena be. If they're phenomena yeah. happy, let them be. Let the breathing breathe. Let the body breathe. Let everything happen. Who yeah. am I? That's all Bhagavan asks us to find out. We can yeah. find out who am I only by holding on to I, letting yeah. go of everything else. Yeah. So it's continuously letting go of the identification and the false identification. Even letting go, we need, need not worry about. Yeah. All because we need to do is to hold on to ourselves. The yeah. letting go happens automatically. Yeah. Because the thing is, these things are not holding on to us. The body and the breath and the mind, these things are not holding on to us. We are holding on to them. We say, I am this body. So the, the fault lies with us. Hold on to ourselves. When we hold on to ourselves, we thereby let go of other things. So if we try and let go, our attention is on whatever we're trying to let go of. So we can, in effect, we can let go only by holding on to ourself. Yeah. Yeah, and holding on to ourself is being and letting go, you could say, is doing. Letting go is ceasing to do by being. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can we continue with the yeah, next yes, question? Yes, yes. Let me see. <clears throat> I try to stay in our true self while meditating, but when I finish, who is the one who needs to do all the worldly things? I automatically fall again in the ego, don't understanding how to do the things still connected with the true self. Um, Bhagavan has made it clear, but whatever needs to be done, will be done. Whatever is to happen will happen. Whatever is not to happen will not happen. Whatever we, we, whatever our mind, speech or body needs to do in order to, uh, in, in order to enable what is to happen to happen, it, it, it will, the mind, speech and body will be made to do accordingly. So we don't have to worry about doing. Bhagavan's teachings are not about doing, but about being. If we hold on to our being, all the doings will go on as they're meant to go on. So let's not, let's not be concerned about doing. All we have to be concerned about is about being. Who am I? It's our being that we are investigating. The doing is 
the doing is a problem only because we identify ourselves as the doer. We identify ourselves as the doer because we mistake ourselves to be this body and mind, which are the instruments that do actions. So instead of identifying ourselves with the body and mind and thereby getting caught up in action, let's hold on to our being. The more we hold on to our being, we are thereby disconnecting from the body and mind. And so they can go on doing their actions as in accordance with prarabdha. That is, the mind, speech and body will be made to act. Bhagavan is very precise. He said, God will make, he who is for that. He said, in the note he wrote for his mother, in the first sentence, he says, in accordance with the prarabdha of each one, he who is for that, being there, there, will cause to dance. He who is for that means God or Guru, the one who's, who, who has ordained, who has allotted this destiny to us, this prarabdha to us. Uh, being there, there means implies being in every place. Uh, the deeper implication is being in the heart of each and every one of us. So since he is in our, in our heart, he will make our mind, speech and body do whatever they need to do in accordance with prarabdha. What they need to do in accordance with prarabdha means in order for the prarabdha to unfold, certain actions are necessary on our part. That those actions are actions, not our actions, they're actions of mind, speech, and body. So God will make the mind, speech, and body do those actions. So we need not concern ourselves with that. All we need to concern ourselves with is holding on to our being and thereby giving, separating ourselves from these instruments of action. In other words, we need to give up the doership. We can give up the doership only by giving up the false identification, I am this body. And we can give up that only by holding on to our own being, I am. But we also need to remember, we are undergoing a process. None of us are yet holding on to our being uh, 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 constantly. We sh that's what we need to do. We, we are working towards that, but most of us are, are still in the stage where our mind is sometimes going within and sometimes going outwards. Let's be realistic with ourselves. We, this, this is the situation we're in. So we shouldn't get disheartened because we're not 100% successful. We just keep on trying. However many times our mind goes outwards and we get caught up in actions and doing actions and all these things, don't worry about it. But remember, every time we notice our attention has gone outwards, let's turn it back and try to hold on to our being. The more we hold on to our being, the more we separate ourselves from these instruments of action and the more the, the sense of doership will will wane and it will be destroyed completely only when ego is destroyed. I hope that's a clear answer to that question. I hope also. Yeah. Uh, I think you also answered the last question that was asked, namely, how can I be and also do things? I find it impossible if I have things to do. I find it impossible to do not to not do well, them as ego. How can I solve this? OK. We're, we cannot do anything without being. So being is the constant. Uh, <clears throat> however, when this question is asked, how can I be, that what is implied is, how can I just be and also do things? Well, if we're doing things, we are not just being. Because in order to do things, we need to rise as ego. So we need not do things. That is what needs to be done as I say, God will make the mind, speech, of God or Guru, whatever we want to say, Bhagavan, will make our mind, speech and body do whatever they need to do. So it should not concern us. Doing should not concern us. Our only concern should be with being. If we hold on to, to the extent to which we hold on to our being, we thereby cease rising. And when we cease rising, we... 
what raises his ego. When we raise his ego, we take these, this body and mind to be ourself, and therefore we feel I am doing these actions. I am doing the actions of body, I'm doing the actions of speech, I'm doing the actions of mind. That is, I'm sitting, uh, talking, uh, sitting, walking, um, uh, working, all these actions of body. I'm speaking, that's action of speech. Uh, I'm thinking, that's action of mind. All these are actions done by these instruments. We feel that we are doing them because we identify these instruments as I. That is the mistake we make. In order to give up this identification, we need to hold on to our being, hold on to I am alone. The more we hold on to I am, the more ego subsides, and the more we thereby separate ourselves from any connection with this body and mind. So, so long so, as we, th if I have to do things, I find it impossible to, to not do them as ego. Let those things that need to be done, let them be done. Why do you, why do we need to feel that I have to do them? It's that I that is the problem. Hold on to the, the essence of that I, which is pure being, and the actions will go on as they're meant to go on. It need not concern us. I hope that adequately answers that question. Yeah, a, a quick follow up, if that's okay, just to yes. make it practical. Um, <clears throat> so this talk is happening. I could identify with I am doing. I'm asking yeah. you questions. I am yeah. listening. But um, if I'm listening correctly to you, it's kind of seeing that that identification is happening, that doership, and instead of that, who? To whom is this happening? And just yeah. and uh, and just be self attentive while who is, this is happening. Who is experiencing this doership? Yeah. Who mm -hmm. feels I am doing? Who is this doer? Yeah. yeah. That be, who is this I who thinks I am doing? Yeah, the one that Hold identifies on to the I. Yeah. 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 Let the doing take care of itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we have the last question, uh, that is, must we first achieve a state of Manoleya to then proceed to Manonasa, or is it simply a matter of purifying the mind so we can turn within and hold our attention on our true self? Um, well, firstly, achieving a state of Manoleya is no big deal. We achieve a state of Manoleya every night when we go to bed. Uh, sleep is a state of manoleya. So manoleya is no big deal. Though manoleya and manonasa are both uh, states of dissolution of mind, they are fundamentally different because manoleya is just a temporary dissolution. So th that temporary dissolution happens naturally every night when we fall asleep because we too tired to continue all this mental activity, we fall asleep. They, we subside in mano layer. Mano nasa is something completely different. Mano nasa can be achieved only by um, only by uh, being aware of ourselves as we actually are. So mano nasa can be achieved only by means of self-investigation turning our attention within and holding on to our being. If when we are practicing self-investigation, there are two things that can uh, disturb or, or uh, uh, divert us away from self-attentiveness. One is the rising of thoughts. That we, we allow our attention to go away from ourselves, we get carried away by thought. The other is falling asleep. Both of these result because of what is called pramada. Pramada means inattentiveness, negligence, self-negligence. If we are not holding on to our, our self firmly enough, we can either get distracted by thoughts, we can allow thoughts to rise and get carried away by them, or we can subside in sleep. If we are holding on to self-attentiveness firmly, manoleya cannot occur. 
If manolaya occurs while we are practicing self-investigation, it is because we've let go of that self-investigation. We've let go of the self-attentiveness. So some people have an idea. First, you have to achieve uh, Kevala Nivikalpa Samadhi, and then only you can achieve Sahaja Nivikalpa Samadhi. Kevala Nivikalpa Samadhi is a type of manolaya. Sahaja Nivikalpa Samadhi is another name for Manonasa. We do not need to achieve Kevala Nivikalpa Samadhi because Kevala Nivikalpa Samadhi is just another state of Manalaya. We've had enough of Manalaya. We sleep every night. Sleeping is, sleep, being in Manalaya is very pleasant. Whether that Manalaya is Kevala Nivikalpa Samadhi or coma or sleep or general anesthesia, it's a very pleasant state because it's a state free of mind. So what remains in that state is just that pure happiness that is our own real nature. But we cannot stay in Manolaya forever because the mind is not destroyed. So sooner or later, the mind is going to rise again. So we Manolaya is it's a false goal to have. Some people take that to be the goal of spiritual practice or at least an intermediate goal. It is neither the final goal, nor is it an intermediate goal. It is just a temporary rest on the journey. If you're traveling, sometimes you get tired, you need to stop and have a rest, it's just like that. But we don't, the, the, we don't need any state of manolaya other than sleep. We all need sleep because we, 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 the mind is active during the day and it gets tired and it needs to fall asleep. But other than sleep, no manolaya is necessary. Um, if, we, if we don't destroy the mind, sooner or later we'll achieve an, another form of manolaya, which is called death, which is just a state, state like sleep from which we'll rise again and begin dreaming some new dream. We'll take ourselves to be some new person. But um, so our sole aim is Manonasa. Forget about Manolaya. Manolaya, it will happen inevitably, at least in the form of sleep. Sooner or later, it'll happen in the form of death. That does, need not concern us. What we, we, our sole goal is Manonasa. And manonasa means destruction of mind. Since the root of the mind is ego, we cannot destroy the mind without eradicating ego. Since ego is a false awareness of ourself, it can be eradicated only by correct awareness of ourself. So it is only by means of self-investigation that we can achieve manonasa. Bhagavan is very, very clear on this point in um, in Nana. He he says several times that in order to make mind cease, implying to, in order to make it cease permanently, there's no other adequate means except uh, vichara. And in the eighth paragraph, he begins by saying that, and then he ends up by saying, therefore, pranayama is a means to restrain the mind, but cannot bring about manonasa. So pranayama can bring about manolaya, it cannot bring about manonasa. So the simple answer to the question is, no, we need not achieve manolaya. Our sole aim is manonasa. Manolaya doesn't in any way contribute towards Manonasa. It's just a, a, a diversion on the way, a temporary rest, very pleasant rest, but it's still, the, the, we haven't reached our goal. We, have, we need to continue our journey in order to reach our final goal, which is Manonasa. I hope that was a, a clear and adequate answer to that question. It sounded clear for me, but I hope it's yeah. clear for this person. So thank you for yeah. the answers. We we have we have answered all the questions that were yeah. asked. Sean? Yes, may I ask one more question? Yes. Um, in GVK 989, it says, since silence, the summit of knowledge, is the common nature of each and every religion, all religions, matas, are agreeable as a means to true Advaita, which shines unique and pure, and hence they are not opposed to the wonderful Vedanta. Can you please speak about that, please? Um, yes, that that is. Uh, 
there are lots of people who like to criticize a Dvaita. Even among a, even, even if we just consider the different forms of Vedanta, most of the, the main target of, of criticism for most other forms of Vedanta is a Dvaita. They don't like a Dvaita because it's for, I mean, for so many reasons. Firstly, I think one of the main reasons people don't like a Dvaita is they don't understand a Dvaita. There's a very widely held view but a Dvaita is somehow opposed to Bhakti, or there's no room for Bhakti in a Dvaita, which is a complete misunderstanding. Bhakti is the very heart of a Dvaita. You cannot have a Dvaita jnana without Bhakti. But it is the, the pinnacle of Bhakti is a Dvaita jnana. That is, um, Bhakti is the heart of jnana, and jnana is the blossoming of bhakti. So you can't have one without the other. But there's a, a widely held view that uh, the Advaita is somehow opposed to um, opposed to bhakti. That is because of a lack of understanding of what Advaita really is. Even among Advaitins, there are many Advaitins who look down on bhakti as some sort of inferior path. So they haven't understood either Advaita or Bhakti because you, you cannot have Advaita, you cannot have Jnana without Bhakti. As Bhagavan often said, Bhakti is the mother of Jnana. So, but anyway, because people misunderstand Advaita, because they find Advaita somehow threatening, the idea that I alone exist, that's somehow very frightening to people. Um, it's most people that the majority of people following other systems, they're somehow opposed to Advaita. But as Bhagavan indicates in this verse that you just read, Advaita is in no way opposed to any other schools of thought. Because from the perspective of Advaita, all these other different different spiritual philosophies, they're all appropriate to different paths. And all these paths are a means to purify the mind. And when the mind is sufficiently purified, the appeal of a dvaita, I mean, a dvaita will naturally appeal to the purified mind. It's only the impure mind that will somehow feel a, threatened by a dvaita. One way of expressing Advaita is that God alone exists. So we have to give ourselves wholly to God. We have to lose ourselves in God. Because we have no real existence separate from God. If we put it in those terms, for some people, it will make it, uh, Advaita sound a bit more appealing. But even that is not appealing for... But some people just don't like the idea of losing their individuality. Why they don't like the idea of losing their individuality? Because of the impurity of mind. So all these other paths, these so many other paths are there. There are so many different bhakti practices, yoga practices, and uh, so on. The, all these different practices are means to purify the mind. When the mind is sufficiently purified, it will automatically gravitate towards a Dvaita. Take Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, for example. He didn't start off on the path of a Dvaita. He was a simple Kali Bhakta. But his Bhakti was of such, a, such an elevated, uh, pure Bhakti he had. But when Mother Kali brought uh, Totapuri there, and Totapuri was trying to give uh, uh, teach, uh, Advaita teachings to Ramakrishna. He didn't want to hear at all. But finally, he said, OK, if you want to teach me this, I will. But first, I have to ask my mother. So he went to Kali and he asked Kali. And Kali said, yes, I have brought him here for this purpose. You learn for Then he fully accepted it. Mother has said, OK, OK, he went and... I don't think, um, who am I to judge? I, I'm not the one to say who is Nyani, who is not Nyani, but still, I, I have my doubts about how 
how spiritually mature Totopuri was. But he served a purpose. He was a catalyst. He, he set Ramakrishna on the path of, of, uh, of jnana. And because Ramakrishna, his bhakti was of such an elevated bhakti, he, just a, just a little uh, uh, turn he needed, and he was established in that state of, of, of jnana. Then he was completely absorbed. To be outward looking person, it looked like he was in Kavala Nivikalpa Samadhi. In fact, he was in Sahaja Samadhi. And just like Bhagavan was in the early days in Tiruvannamalai, he was just unconcerned about anything else. He was totally um, relevant, relishing, I mean, uh, reveling in himself in that uh, Advaita Jnana. Uh, but later, because of the prarabdha of the body, he 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 uh, things happened, and he came back, and and he he seemed to uh, live what we call a normal life, <laughs> the life of the body. But that's only in our view. But that Ramakrishna is a very good example of how, when the bhakti is mature enough, auto, but, uh, only a little turn is necessary to bring to a path of, I mean, to bring to a goal of jnana. Just that little turn is necessary. So um, all other paths lead to this path, ultimately lead to this path of self-investigation. So from the perspective of Advaita, Advaita is not opposed to any other path. That's why in Uladunapadu, in, in verses two and three, Bhagavan, right from the beginning, he makes it very clear, these teachings are not for engaging in disputes with others. Well, the purpose of Uludunapadu is to be in that state without I. Without I means without ego. That is agreeable to all, as Bhagavan says. So that is the aim of Uludunapadu. So the Advaita uh, teachings are not to be given to those who are not yet ready for it. If others come and ask us, we can share what we un whatever we have understood. But we shouldn't go and tell others then, because the majority of people will not find Advaita appealing. But from the perspective of Advaita, all other paths are perfectly acceptable because We've all been through these other paths. We've all been through these paths of dualistic bhakti and so on. Or if, if not that, yoga, something we've been through to come to this. Uh, we, we, wouldn't have, we, we wouldn't be ready for this path if we hadn't already been through other paths. So everything has its place. That's why Vedanta is such a beautiful system, because in Vedanta... It, the, the prasthana treya of Vedanta is the Upanishads, the, uh, uh, the Bhagavad Gita and the Brahma Sutra. All of these texts give room to be interpreted in different ways. You can perfectly well, um, very easily interpret these, uh, these works in the light of Vishistha Dvaita. If you want to really torture them, you can even interpret them in the light of Dvaita, as Madhava did, and Madhava's followers do. It, it, sometimes it's, they have to really stretch things, even with the Gita. It, you, you really have to stretch things to give a, Dvaitic, a, a dualistic interpretation, but there's room for that also. And there's also room for a Dvaitic interpretation. Why, is, why do these texts give room for all these different interpretations? Because that's what is necessary. As Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said, a mother doesn't give the same food to her newborn baby as she gives to her 20-year-old child. Different food is appropriate at different stages of a child's development. Likewise, different spiritual practices are appropriate at different stages of, um, of our spiritual development. And there is a philosophies appropriate to each of these different types of practice. So from the perspective of Advaita, Advaita has no quarrel with anything. Let anyone quarrel with Advaita, that's also not a problem. If they want to criticize Advaita, 
There are some who refer to Advaitins as impersonalists. But that's a complete misunderstanding because the uh, Advaitins do not say God is impersonal. Advaitins say God is love itself. How can someone who says God is love itself be an impersonalist? But that's how they view Advaita because they don't, they're not ready to go deeper into it. So they, they, they use straw man argument against the Dvaita and they just label it as, um, uh, as impersonalist or Mayavadin. Uh, but Bhagavan said that, that is often uh, they refer to a uh, of Shankara as Mayavada. Bhagavan said, how can Shankara be a Mayavadin? And you don't call someone who says God doesn't exist to be an Ishwaravadin. They call him an atheist. So uh, uh, an Ishwaravadi means someone who, who, who contends that there is a God. So a Mayavadi is someone who says there is Maya. But according to Shankara, Maya is not... Is, uh, uh, um, yama sa Maya. She who is not is Maya. That is the word Maya. Ya means who? Who? She who, uh, ma means not. So maya is yam, yama is maya. So when Shankara says maya is not real, how can you call him a maya vadin? But Bhagavan said, but they love to call, they, they love to call Advaitins maya vadin because they just don't like Advaita. Fine, let them not like Advaita. There's no problem for us. If someone doesn't like the food we we like, do we do we get upset about it? Oh no, you must eat this food. Why should we? Why should we? Just because we like a particular food, we shouldn't expect others to like the same food we like. So we like a dwaiter. A dwaiter appeals to us. We are very fortunate, and we can, from the perspective of a dwaiter, everything else has its own place. It's because. Since not everyone is ready, even Bhagavan, when people ask Bhagavan questions, Bhagavan answers questions at so many different levels, appropriate to the questioner. When, um, when Yogananda asked Bhagavan, what teaching should be given for the uplift of the masses, Bhagavan said, no teachings can be given on mass. Teaching should be according to the taught. So different teachings are appropriate at different levels. Bhagavan exemplified that in the answers he gave. If you read books like Talks and Day by Day, you can see Bhagavan is talking at so many different levels, appropriate to the questioner. That's why we can't get the... We, it's difficult to get to the real heart of Bhagavan's teachings by reading such books. If you want to get to the real heart of Bhagavan's teachings, we need to go to his own original writings. He gave Nana for Shiva Prakash and Palai, who was a, a, a very pakva soul, a very mature, ripe soul. He gave Uludu Napdu, Padeshundia, Amna um, uh, um, for Murugana. Because, so it's appropriate to Murugana because Murugana is a very uh, highly advanced um, aspirant. He got teachings which were appropriate to his level. So we are very fortunate that Bhagavan has given us these works. And he's also given us Arunachas Duty Panchikam, which was not at anyone's request, it, that it brought, spontaneously poured out of his heart. But even in the same Arunachas Duty Panchikam, we find the same Advaita teachings are there. But that in, in the language of bhakti, in the most heart-melting language of bhakti, in the matara bhava, the, the bhava of a, of a love between a, a, a young maiden and her b beloved lord, in that language, which is the, in the bhakti traditions, is considered the very purest form of bhakti, in that language, Bhagavan has, in Akram Rai, expressed the highest Advaitic truths. So, um, from the perspective of, particularly from the, as I said, some Advaitins 
think that uh, look down on bhakti as some sort of inferior part. But Bhagavan has made it clear there can be no jnana without bhakti. So Bhagavan has given a central place to bhakti and to the need for grace. So actually, Bhagavan's teachings, if people were... If people were ready to accept a Dvaita, Bhagavan did the very most appealing teaching because it fully appeals to the heart and it fully appeals to the jnana aspect. So Bhagavan's teachings are the, the fullness of bhakti and the fullness of jnana. Is that a, a clear answer to your question? It is, if you don't mind, I'd like to say a little bit. Um, yeah. One thing I've noticed is like part of the problem with Advaita is like, like if you're told that you're God, it's kind of like if you're not ready for a teaching like that, that you can think, oh, I as ego am God, which is the exact opposite of the point of the teaching. The point is like you have so much bhakti for God that God alone is reality and we are that. <laughs> no distinction anymore because because yeah. you have you're completely filled with god it's only god he alone is i alone am yeah how can anything other than god exist if god is infinite nothing can be other than him but of course any teaching can be misunderstood as bhagavan said to lakshman sharma according to the purity of yantakarana the same teaching reflects in different ways so a Dvaita can be misinterpreted, can be misunderstood by people, and there will always be people who misunderstand. But if we're attracted to this path, to, to, and attracted in the right way, if we really understand what it's about, the humblest thing to say is, there is no I other than God. God alone is. That is the real import. That is the real message of uh, of Advaita. And that's pure love. I mean, what yeah, could yeah. be more loving? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Parabhakti. Give, give, giving ourselves wholly to God. That is what Advaita is all about. Dissolving the, the seeming distinction between self and God. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arana Chalaramanaya. Thank you, Michael. That was a beautiful ending of the start, the erroneous yeah. awareness and then being what we actually are. Yeah. Yeah. But all these <clears throat> all these different things, they're all in the Bhagavan's teachings, everything is so interconnected, so coherent. Well, I feel very quiet at the moment, <laughs> introverted, so very pleasant. <laughs> so thank you very much, Michael. Right, you're welcome. Sean, something you want to say? I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, Michael. It's always yeah. a joy. Okay, it well, is. thank you. Thank you. It was very, very helpful. I'm certainly going to listen to it again and reflect on some things that you said because as mm -hmm. i said i'm currently very very attracted to verses uh, 17 and 80 of uladu napadu and now i can yeah. take also verse yeah. 27 and verse 32 yeah. 31 in it yeah. as you mentioned yeah. them so that would be a joy to reflect on yeah, yeah. i wish you if a wonderful... we understand one of those verses we'll understand both of them because they're they're, they're structured in a very parallel way yeah well, the sense that I'm getting, if I'm if I'm focused on what is said there, it, I get a um, a feeling of peace and extreme si sim simpleness. <laughs> yes. But yes, then, of yes. course, uh, fasanas arise again, and and the continuous. What, what can so... be simpler than one only without a second? Yeah. Yeah. This is the ultimate simplicity. <laughs> <laughs>